What if getting a milder case of COVID meant your doctor could call in a prescription for a pill that could protect you from serious symptoms of the disease, all while you recover at home? Sounds like a future game changer, doesn't it? And Pfizer says that future is now. This afternoon, the drug maker asked federal regulators to authorize its new experimental COVID pill, Paxlovid. If approved for emergency use, which could come as soon as Thursday, yes, Thursday of this week, Paxlovid would be the first oral antiviral of its kind, an at-home treatment that could be prescribed to high-risk patients at the first sign of infection. Pfizer says Paxlovid cut the risk of hospitalization or death by almost 90%, a remarkable result. Before applying for emergency use here in the US, earlier in the day, Pfizer also announced a deal with a UN-backed group that will allow other manufacturers around the globe to produce the oral medication, a move that could make the treatment available to more than half the world's population, including in poorer parts of the world where vaccinations, of course, have lagged. You can see on this map the disparity of vaccine doses administered in Western countries versus countries in the developing world. More than 5 million lives have been lost to COVID globally, and that's a conservative estimate. 7.5 billion vaccine doses have been administered globally, but it hasn't been enough. In fact, it's barely scratching the surface in poorer countries where people have been hard hit by the virus. So will this help balance the scales, at least after infection? Here to talk about that and more is immunologist Dr. Kizmekia Corbett. As part of the coronavirus vaccine team at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Corbett helped develop what became the Moderna vaccine. These days, she continues her groundbreaking vaccine research as part of the faculty at Harvard University School of Public Health. Thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. You were one of the driving forces behind what became the Moderna vaccine. So first off, as a recipient of the Moderna vaccine, I just got my booster today. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. How much have these COVID vaccines been a game changer, Dr. Corbett? Because on the one hand, they've massively cut down the risk of death and hospitalization, allowed people to do normalish things again. On the other hand, we're still in a pandemic. And yes, we still have breakthrough cases too. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. It is quite a pleasure. Um, you know, vaccines across the board save lives. I like to say that tagline over and over again, and that is exactly what these vaccines are doing, albeit obviously distribution across the globe is lagging quite a bit. Um, and we are seeing some breakthrough infections, but overall the severity of disease and hospitalizations and deaths are significantly reduced in vaccinated people. And so of course it has been a game changer. Beyond allowing people to, re to resume normal activities, it gives people peace of mind that if they come in contact with the virus that causes COVID-19, that if they're vaccinated, they would fare better than if they were not vaccinated. Yeah. And of course, the holidays are quickly approaching and across the country, we're seeing a rise in COVID cases. Again, six states have seen a 40% spike. Minnesota is seeing the worst of breakthrough cases. Hospitals are overwhelmed. And according to the CDC, the state is nearing 9,000 deaths since the pandemic began. Minnesota had the worst seven day case rate uh, in the country as of Sunday. Why are we seeing an increase, not just in unvaccinated patients that we know about, but also breakthrough cases? When you have increased transmission, particularly when it's clustered in a particular area, for example, one state like Minnesota, um, you're going to see breakthrough cases, both in vaccinated people and obviously in unvaccinated people, you'll see a lot of cases. The one thing that is important to remember is that this is all based on the population and the amount of people that are vaccinated, the age of the population, how long ago they got vaccinated, and also as people start to move in the fall and winter months, as we start to come into these holidays, Halloween just passed, you'll start to see an uptick or so-called surges in different places. And that is in so many ways something that we expected. This is things that epidemiologists have been warning about since even the latter parts of the summer. And so it really means that everyone should, number one, get their first and second doses of the vaccines if you got the mRNA vaccines, or your first dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And then if you are in those really vulnerable populations, those populations that are elderly or immunocompromised, to ensure that you get your boosters so that you can remain adequately protected against severe disease. So let's talk about the COVID pill. What is your reaction to today's news from Pfizer about this pill? Could it be as big a game changer as the vaccines? 
Absolutely. Or, you know, equally or more, depending on how you think about it, right? We have an entire world to protect and to ensure stays alive in the middle of a pandemic. So whether it be via vaccination or as the vaccines are lagging to getting to the, to other corners of the world, via pills such as the Pfizer pill that can really prevent people from getting severely ill, hospitalized, um, or, or dying from this virus. We have to make sure that we utilize all the tools in our toolbox. And so I'm very happy that these different companies are bringing on drugs that have this type of um, efficacy um, in clinical trials. Dr. Corbett, as a scientist, did you ever imagine that vaccines would become such a source of controversy, so politically polarizing, even more so in many ways than masks, which was crazy enough? Yes, actually, because before I was a scientist, I was a person that lived in rural North Carolina, and I understood what the education gap was oftentimes the knowledge gap when it comes to just really the nitty gritties of people's health. And a lot of times that is really the basis of what health disparities are. And also um, I am a black woman. And so I do understand how the medical institution has played a large role in um, having so much distrust among certain populations. And all of those things coming together with a brand new virus, um, new technologies, and a lot of language for people to understand on a very day in and day out basis. I certainly empathize with that. Um, what I will say is that it has opened my eyes to just how far we have to go as scientists, as educators, vaccinologists, and medical professionals to really start to inform people and continue to have conversations like we're having tonight on your show um, and, and also in the community. So on that note, you mentioned, you're right, it's not just Trump supporters or rural conservatives who are skeptical of the vaccine, people of color, especially black Americans who have had bad experiences with the healthcare system, have also been vaccine hesitant. Uh, I've seen Dr. Fauci, when he's asked about this, talk about your role in vaccine development. You're a black woman doctor who helped give the world a miraculous COVID vaccine. What do you personally say? I'm just curious to black friends or family members who are maybe hesitant about it, distrusting even. How do you make the case to them? Well, I don't say anything unless I'm asked because I think what is my role um, and where I sit now is, you know, I have been in the lab since I was 16. So obviously my understanding is a little bit deeper and I can appreciate that than the, than the average person. And each one person has their own story. Each one person has their own inquiry about the vaccine. And so at this point, um, having been a vaccine developer and being a professor at Harvard and all of these things, it is my turn to simply listen. And I think that if we took that approach across the entire medical institution, we can certainly start to make some headway and not just with black people, um, to be clear, to with everyone, yes. right? Vaccine hesitancy or vaccine inquisitiveness, as I like to call it, really is just the um, boiling up so to speak, of a lot of people voicing their concerns that, they, that they've had for so long, whether it be about vaccines or their health in general. Last week, the House Select Committee, Dr. Corbett, the House Select Committee on the Coronavirus Crisis released emails showing how the Trump administration pressured CDC officials to alter scientific guidance and COVID reports, prevented them from communicating directly with the public. You were a senior figure at NIH working under Dr. Fauci. Trump even came to see you. Did you ever feel any pressure from the administration, from the White House? Were you on the receiving end of these kind of censoring emails? Absolutely not. Um, and um, if anyone who knows me knows that I don't take well to pressure anyway, I really am here to do the science and um, to do the science well and to really stand in this place where I hope that the public can start to trust science and medicine again, really. And so, no, no pressure at all. The only pressure that I felt was for myself to get the job done well and to do it really quickly so that we could be here right now where we have multiple vaccines that are authorized um, for use um, in this country and around the globe. You certainly did that job well. And yet on the global situation and in, in terms of global inequity, when you see how under-vaccinated, say, Africa is, compared to Europe or North America. 
That's a moral travesty. That's a scandal, is it not? And it's self-defeating, too. We have to get the whole world vaccinated, do we not, if we are going to beat a global pandemic? You are absolutely right. Um, um, we certainly have to get every single person at least having the ability to choose whether they want to be vaccinated or not. That is where I stand. And I think that um, we are certainly a long way from that, but I'd like to sometimes look at the bright side. Whereas in normal times um, prior to this moment where we've come upon these revolutionary technologies, where we've come upon global collaboration, and we really have these types of technologies that we can deploy across the world, we'd be in a certainly different stance two years into a pandemic and perhaps without a vaccine to talk about it all. And so um, while we do have a long way to go, we certainly have come far. In order for this pandemic to get under our belt and to go into what we call the endemic phase, this is where we aren't seeing large amounts of deaths from this virus. This is where we really are li living in what we call an equilibrium with this virus. We're certainly yep. going to have to vaccinate all over the world and we're going to have to start to take a lot of other public health precautions like testing on mass scale and et cetera. So last question, you mentioned endemic. People talk about the new normal. Is this it? Are we in it? Is this pandemic ever going to be over or is COVID with us forever? It's endemic. COVID, I think, and I, I actually called this, a, a, I think probably even around maybe April or something of last year, where we have allowed this virus to transmit around the world. Um, and so much um, has happened. And the virus is basically here with us today. Um, no telling where the virus is in animal reservoirs and et cetera. So we're going to get to the point, just like we are with our typical flu season, where people, a lot of people might get the sniffles. There will be, unfortunately, some people, particularly in vulnerable populations, that will die every year. But at least with mass vaccination and a complete understanding of the science of this virus and also a general public's understanding of how to deal with their infections, whether it be with a pill or otherwise, we can get to the point where we can live with the virus um, in the endemic or seasonal state, so to speak. Dr. Kismeke Corbett, uh, so many more questions for you, but we're out of time. Appreciate you taking time out to speak with us this evening. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.